right there, everybody. Welcome along to this special market update. I have been strategically biting my tongue, right? At least publicly here on this YouTube resource that people subscribe to and listen to generally routine market commentary. Again, I've been uh, busy each Saturday recording those pro analysis classes for that private group. However, again, I've been waiting for interesting signals, right, to show up on these markets as they have continued to close the open windows that did open back in the month of February of this year. We have closed the majority of them on a select few number of markets. And now is the first opportunity, the real occasion to point out to you a really big abnormality, right, or a historical sort of uh, point of significance that has coincided back in the year 2000 and also more recently when it comes to both uh, the business and economic cycle, right, the market cycle itself, more recently back in the month of October, right, 2007. I will preface this from saying that yes, I understand it is the first time again publicly on YouTube that I have put out market commentary. However, I do believe it is in your best interest uh, to sort of stop what you're doing if you are listening to this analysis video, or at least concentrate more so on what it is I have to talk to you about in this particular video. Because again, or at least not again, but on Tuesday, Tuesday of this week just gone, the markets, or at least the S&P 500, has done something very interesting, something that it hasn't done um, outside of two occasions in the past two decades, 20 years, which I think uh, you really need to listen to and be aware of. So really from the outset of this recording, what I will not be doing is going through really the big technical picture of the markets, the macro picture, right? The intermediate timeframes and also the minor levels. This is going to be from the standpoint and really the standpoint only of uniformity. And when I mention the word uniformity, okay, or market uniformity, we're talking about market indices really compared to one another, right? Are they in agreement? Are they confirming? Essentially, is one of the Dow, uh, one of the tenets of Dow theory, pardon me, are they working in conjunction and is, right, to some extent, the industrials confirming the transports. Now, although in this particular video, I'm not going to be talking about that general connection of the transports and, right, uh, the industrial averages, which again is still quite a ways away from their historical highs back in the month of February, this is going to be in regard to, right, the S&P 500 and the S&P 500 only. It has been a pretty good sort of centerpiece between that of the NASDAQ, which continues to skyrocket, right? Largely led by a dwindling few selection of individual companies, otherwise known as the FANG stocks, right? Plus one or two others, which at this particular point, it appears as though a number of those companies are beginning to trickle off. And again, uh, a lesser and lesser concentration are really contributing to this exuberance that we are seeing in the NASDAQ. And really that differentiating, right, between everything else. And when I say this, this is where it gets critical. I want you to understand this, okay? As at the current juncture, really, and, and this is going back to the all-time closing high on the S&P uh, 500 that was achieved on Tuesday, I want you to listen very closely to this. Neither, right, the equal weight S&P 500, which is a variation of this that you're looking at on my screen at this particular time. So neither the equal weight S&P 500, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, right, the Dow Industrials and the Dow Transportation or Transportational Average, those are generally the two connections that we make when we reference Dow theory. And in continuance of this, the utilities and in addition, the Russell 2000, right, have confirmed the new high which was made on the S&P 500 on Tuesday. Let me just repeat that one more time. From the standpoint of uniformity, neither the equal weight S&P 500, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, the Dow Industrials, the Dow Transportation, the utilities or the Russell 2000 have confirmed the new high in the S&P 500 index, which is what you were looking at on my screen. If I use my cursor at this particular point, it is this particular candlestick just here. Now, again, what makes this very interesting is that in and of itself, it doesn't really mean a whole lot, right? I mean, if you just say that these other markets, they're lagging, they haven't caught up to the S&P 500, fair, that's a pretty you know honest assessment of what we're looking at. And a lot of people can make that argument. However, 
From the standpoint of other occasions where we have seen this occurrence, and again, this is a moving target right at this particular point. Since Tuesday, obviously, we've had Wednesday session. It was a little bit of a sort of an outside day daily candlestick. Nothing or at least no follow through yet. We'll see what happens during Thursday session. But if you wanted to go back on the two other occasions whereby we have seen this exact relationship play out since the turn of the century, right? The past 20 years... We have to go back or start, of course, uh, the year 2000, just to be very specific about this. The last time that we saw this occur to the exact date, I'm on a weekly chart just so I can drag this on over to get the exact date over here. But that exact date was the 1st of September 2000. And I'll just give you the second date just here. It was the 9th of October of 2007. So if I make my way over to the 1st of September in 2000, you can see just here, whereby we printed this high, right? This particular phenom that we've seen on two occasions outside of the current junction, more or less, the S&P was positioned up here at 15 or 1,525 points, right? All of those other markets that I've referenced were not confirming what the S&P was doing. And this was after a prolonged stagnation whereby the S&P 500 had been moving sideways for quite some time, right? There's rhythm to these types of movements. There's rhythm to market cycles. They are not identical. However, there are similarities, right? And largely what we are referencing from the standpoint of uniformity is market breadth. Okay, so that particular candlestick here, again, just to repeat myself, the 1st of September is coinciding, right? At this particular point through to Tuesday's candlestick that we've seen now, which essentially, if you're watching this on Thursday, is two days ago. Right now, if I show you what happened next, as per the S&P 500, right, it ushered in, right, a legitimate bear market. Now, I understand that most people are connecting the dots between the meltdown that occurred in February, obviously due to COVID and the global outbreak of the pandemic that is and is really still omnipresent around the world. But what people are really, I guess, disconnected from was the state of the markets, right, leading into COVID. From the very beginning, right, we've said that this or the reaction of this was an event-driven reaction by the market. But what the market still has to reckon with is the actual cycle itself. Think about it. Since March of 2009, the markets have been essentially in a 10-year bull market. That was obviously broken in the month of February and into the month of March. But it was a 10-year period whereby the markets we're pretty happy, right? Continuing on their merry ways, creating a series of high highs and higher lows. And they hadn't actually encountered, obviously, the other side of the market cycle, which is unfortunately the recessionary aspect of that. Now, again, on average, this lasts 31 to 38 months, all right? Depending on certain inversions in the bond market and essentially what happens after, once the curve begins to steepen, right? And equities wake up. Now, we're still in that sort of twilight period at this particular point. Right? And I'm just showing you the coincidence that's just occurred as at Tuesday. Now, more recently, and I'm going to extend this one bit further as well, right? outside of this simple connection that I'm making to you at this particular point. The second occurrence of this relationship, as I've said, I think on two other occasions, was the 9th of October, 2007. So again, if you have a look at this chart, if you go to the 9th of October up here, the S&P 500, very similar if you wanted to think about in the year 2000. This is essentially February. You get the breakdown, right? Uh, people are momentarily afraid in that period of time over the space of about one month. The markets move parabolic, right? Up until the point right now, the NASDAQ disconnects. It's up here, essentially, where my cursor is at this particular point. The S&P makes another all-time high as it's done on, on Tuesday as at a closing price, Right, but all of those other markets, once again, let me just repeat them. All right, the Ecoate S and P five hundred, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, the industrials and the transportational averages, the utilities, and also the Russell two thousand, failing to make that subsequent higher high at this particular point. What happens next? Right, again, the rhythm of the market over time, the cycle catches up. Right, and that is literally to the day. And I'm trying to pinpoint this as, as closely as possible to what has just occurred on Tuesday. Now, again, that cycle, if you think about it, it lasts over a period of about two years, bordering on a little bit further, down to ultimately the lows in March of 2009. The cycle resets. Here we are again. We've been in the midst of a 10-year bull market right through the peak of February. 
And if you pay attention to this as well, this is the S&P, which I'm dragging over in a daily time frame. It's a lot of data, so just bear with me. I know you have to sit through a lot of squiggles on my chart, but more recently, we've had obviously the meltdown. In February and March, we've had the parabolic injection by the Fed, largely um, helping the markets, or at least the psychology, the short-term sentiment of market participants that have levered up once again. This has been, I think, the fastest recovery, right? Recessionary recovery, technically, back to a fresh new all-time high in history, right? For the S&P 500 after this first sell-off. And again, we've just done what we did on those two other ca uh, occasions, pardon me, whereby if we look at some of these outlier indexes, you've got the industrials right here, still a wells away. Below the February high, we've got the New York Composite, right? Uh, index just here, a long way away from its, uh, from its all-time high if we bring up the Russell 2000. Might have to put a dollar inside to actually bring up uh, the Russell 2000 if it wants to work with me. There we go. Long ways, uh, long ways below, pardon me. You can see the divergence, right? Or the bifurcated state of the market at this particular point. I won't bring up the utilities. Um, I mean, quickly, I'll show you the uh, Dow Jones transportational average, right, as well. Quite a distance below. And also, uh, the transports actually made the peak back in, right, 2018 all the way over here, which is still yet to set up actually a higher high. So this is, the, the I guess, the, the bifurcated state of the markets outside of the NASDAQ, which again, right, is exactly what we saw in the year 2000 and also uh, 2007 as well. What I want to do is take this one step further because when you think about, and I've referenced this in the past as well, when you think about uh, just general cycles, market cycles, you generally have um, sectors that lead, right? both the turning up and the turning down. And the more and more I hear and read about, I guess, uh, pundits when it comes to, I guess, finance and the way the markets are moving and positioned and where they believe markets are going to be in X amount of time into the future, a lot of people are failing to pick up on, right? Are the financials leading, right? Or are at least they showing any relative strength whatsoever? And the answer to this question, unfortunately, is no, no, they are not. Yes, they have rebounded off from the March lows, but we have peaked much like equities. I mean, this was a really important period in the very early midst of, of, of June, whereby, again, it was the first sort of real pullback that we saw in equity markets before we bottomed and, and subsequently have run a little bit higher on those other sort of um, indexes that I've referenced. The financials, however, they're still yet to actually break above the high in June. Now, this isn't concerning really in and of itself, but the pattern is very similar to what we have seen both in 2000 and also 2007. I'm going to show you the connection in 2007 as well, because this is really critical, right? I want to show you the rhythm of this. Now, if I change this just to a line chart, it'll just, uh, it'll make it a little bit clearer for you to sort of visually see this. But again, out of the sort of the tech wreck of 2000 down to the lows in, in very early 2003, you can see that was a very clear bullish uptrend, right? We're making a series of high highs, high lows. We're holding the trend line up until the point in 2006, 2007, whereby the financials begin to stagnate. They go through this first sell-off, right? They rally, they fail to make a high high. And essentially what this is, is the back test of this old trend line, which was once old support is new resistance, right? That's where X marks the spot. The reality is, is that if we overlay this, and this is what's really critical for you to understand, if you overlay this same period, right, do you see a connection here? And I'm going to stop and I want you to realize this, right? Don't think about the financials right now, right, in the month of August. I want you to think about what the where the financials were positioned relative to the high back in the period of October, right, of 2007. And think about that date in history whereby... I just told you the relationship as at the 9th of October, 2007. Let me just repeat myself. As at the 9th of October, 2007, which is essentially what this date around here, pretty much around the peak, the S&P 500 was essentially up here if you look back to the February high in, 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 in 2007, right? If this is the peak in 2007, the financials here in October, um, 07, well, in the current juncture, the S&P 500 is pretty much back right where that past historical high was, right in the period of, of February, just a few months ago. All right, so think about it in terms of equity prices. Again, I'm just going to repeat this one more time. Think about this now from the perspective of the S&P 500 in the year 2000. Forget about the months down the bottom. I'm going to uh, overlay this for you. Let's just call this the, the peak of the S&P 500 in February. Over here, COVID comes along the market's tank, right? 
They go through the rebound, which is what we've seen over the past five months. The S&P 500 is back up here relative as to where it was back in the month of February. The big difference here and the big alert, the big warning, the big signal, this is taking this another step further, all right, was what the financials were doing. This is the financial sector ETF back in the period of 2007 at that very same time in October. In October, the financials were not breaking to fresh new all-time highs. They weren't back above where they were in the period of February, right? If we wanted to overlay this with the current time. They were down, right? They were resting all around the trend line. And in fact, what this turned out to be was that back test. But really what I want you to think about is the divergence between where the S&P 500 was and where the XLF uh, ETF, the sector, the financial sector ETF was positioned, right? Big divergence at that critical turning point in history. Again, the, the, it plays out again in, in 2000. I'm just showing you this in, in 2007. This is XLF back in the year of 2007. If we go in the time warp again, and if I bring this all the way back on over through to 2020, this is again still the XLF, the financial sector ETF. And just have a think about this. You've got the S&P 500, right? If we were to overlay this, it's gone through the February sort of massacre. Everyone has levered up, right? Based on, you know, the, the beating of COVID or at least the, the headlines of the vaccination and, and I guess how it's going to be distributed and how everyone's going to be sort of inoculated by or from COVID, I should say, in the year 2021. Everyone's happy. Everyone's over, uh, everyone is over, sorry, optimistic, jubilant, a complete false of, of complacency at this particular point. The financials, if they're leading this in a new market cycle, I mean, if you think about the divergence as to where the S&P 500 is, I mean, that is a big divergence, which is, again, rhyming with history. What makes this even more interesting is that if, again, if I go out into the weekly chart and show you this, just because we're just capturing so much data here from 2009, we've got a very clear uptrend, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty clear um, up until the point whereby we actually broke down below it in the month of March. Now, again, we do not have the definitive answer yet, but this is still, I mean, don't pay attention to this line here, right? Forget that's even here. But you see this line coming from the left-hand side of my screen. If I project this over to the right, then that's what this red sort of extension is over here. Yes, we're just above it, but this could again be the process of the back test, right? You break down below it, you sort of dance around it until ultimately it fails. Now think about it like this. If I take this one step further again, because if you're just looking at this from, I guess, this amount of history from February, you'll be looking at this and saying, oh, it's making a series of higher highs, um, or at least higher lows. I mean, we haven't made that higher high relative to where we were in June. But if I bring up the 200-day simple moving average, not only is the 100 cross below it, not only are we again seeing uh, the indices uh, from the standpoint of uniformity completely breaking down and continuing to really remain that way, what we're seeing on the financials again is rejection. Rejection to the point on the 200 day, rejection to the point again more recently on the 200 day last week. Okay, these are big alert signals for people who are paying attention. If you go back in the time portal again, and we're doing that right now. Do, 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 do. Have a look at, again, the 9th of October, 2007. What was going on around this date, right? The financials, back testing the 200-day simple moving average where the long-term primary bullish trend had been in effect until we started to dance around it. Uh, we got back above it on a few occasions, but for really a space of about three months there, we, we sort of just moved sideways until ultimately the 200-day won out, which led equities lower. Critical because again, S&P 500 at this particular point is sitting up at a fresh new all-time high. Other markets are not confirming it outside of the NASDAQ. So the reason why I'm sitting down right now and why I haven't been public all that much is because, again, I think you understand the narrative that we have about the market, what we've been looking at in terms of the market. Yes, the S&P 500, it has overshot originally where I thought it would actually stop at least, right? Stop a little bit more candidly and um, hold below certain key areas. Since then, we've closed this open window. But again, even if you turn this into a weekly chart and you think about what we've done and where we've gone to, based on valuations as well, it's very similar on a weekly time frame 
to the sideways stagnation that again we saw right up and around this period whereby again everyone is is falling in love once again with the market levering up right being indiscriminate on risk that they are putting on people who were had the life scared out of them in the months of february and march have now just gone hell bent all in right thinking that the worst is behind them covid's done or at least it's on the decline which i hope it is um on a humanitarian level (laughs) more than anything um but again it doesn't defeat or take away the actual market cycle which was in effect prior to covid and the reaction of the market leading into a very very overvalued overstretched hyper bullish sort of mania which at this particular point has just been sort of clicked up a couple more notches which you know for me anyway i thought that was almost unimaginable and impossible so really what i'm trying to say is be very careful up and around these areas. I know everything is looking uber bullish. There are some very serious divergences which have formed again in continuance of the year 2020. And if you wanted to go out on a number of markets which are now setting up over a three-year period, we've got markets that do not confirm the NASDAQ. All you have to do is really look at some of the parabolic moves and the manias that are happening um, in Tesla, for instance, and even Amazon, right? Microsoft more recently, Apple, Google sort of checked out of the party. But really, the, the the sort of the handful of select shares. I mean, I think I think in fact, um, Apple just hit two trillion dollar market cap at least intra session. So I mean, and that's almost a doubling off from the March low. So I mean, we're really seeing capital fly all over the place at this particular point. Again, this isn't really all that tech heavy. It's more of a an interesting sort of uh, relationship that we have seen play out again. If you look at the ten day. Even the 12 day put to call ratio, the extreme sentiment, right, which is just uber bullish to the point where we haven't actually seen more of a, an inverse relationship, right, uh, of subsequent lows. In essence, a more bullish market than where we currently are at this particular point, right here, right now. And generally, that is very dangerous, right? Very dangerous on a number of fractals, especially after, right? the types of movements that we've seen over the past four to five months, right? And the general market cycle too. So I'm going to keep you updated on this, but I wanted to share that with you. Probably going to, I guess, cop some criticism below. I don't really read comments whatsoever. So, you know, fair game, um, out of my control. But again, I'm just trying to share with you, certainly during this period of history as well, Uh, These relationships that very rarely show up, but when they do, you really need to heed the warnings. And although the S&P, it's gone a little bit further than what originally I thought it would, I thought it would peak out at 3,000 points, right? I thought it would stop at 3,000. That would be it. We're up here just below 3,400 points. It's gone up another 400, right? Animal spirits have taken over. That's all well and good. I just don't think it's really going to sort of cement itself up here for all that much longer. And I don't think that there is going to be a permanently high sort of plateau in price. I just don't see it happening whatsoever. History suggests that's unavoidable, or at least the market is unavoidable and actually moving, right? With its longer term cycles as well. So again, a friendly update. I hope you uh, enjoyed that one. I hope it was as clear as possible. Pay attention to the financials. Okay, pay attention to the non sort of committal or non-confirmation between the markets I've referenced. And I hope that was clear enough uh, for you watching along at home. All right. So enjoy everybody. It's James signing off on behalf of Pivot Point Trading. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.